You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today. Welcome to The Fader Interview. I'm Alex Robert Ross, Editorial Director of The Fader. Nobody else in the world has had a career quite like that of Eddie Chacon. He started his first band, Fry By Night, with his two buddies, Cliff and Mike, in the mid-1970s, at the age of 12, playing shows in the Castro Valley's abandoned movie theatres. Fry By Night never took off, but those theatres turned out to be some of the smallest venues those three kids would ever play. Mike Borden founded Faith No More. Cliff Burton joined Metallica. Eddie went in a different direction. He moved to LA, got a job as a staff songwriter at CBS Songs, and earned himself some respectable credits, though the debut solo album he'd been working on turned out to be a flop. He wound up in Miami, signing a deal with, of all people, Luther Campbell of Two Live Crew. The idea was that Chacon would record an album called Sugary under the pseudonym Edward Anthony Lewis. But sessions with the legendary Dust Brothers turned out to be, according to a more recent article in The Guardian, an education in heavy weed consumption. Chacon ended up working as an engineer on two live crews infamous as nasty as they want to be, the first album in history to be legally defined as obscene. But he was 26 years old, and he was no closer to realizing his dreams of working as a solo singer-songwriter. Chacon moved to New York and signed with Josh Deutsch at Capitol Records. Soon after, he met another young, aspiring singer-songwriter, Charles Pettigrew, on the C-Train. The two bonded over a copy of Marvin Gaye's Trouble Man, nobody's sure exactly which of them was carrying the LP, and soon realized that they were both signed to the same man at the same label. They teamed up and, as Charles and Eddie, wound up with one of the biggest R&B hits of the 90s, the smooth and irrepressible Would I Lie To You, and a pretty successful debut album, Duophonic. They also wrote and recorded Wounded Bird, a sugar packet sweet ballad for Tony Scott's true romance. But their second album, Chocolate Milk, would end up being their last. The music industry had changed around them. What they thought would be a hiatus in 1997 turned out to be an amicable breakup. And though they started talking again daily in the early aughts, even sharing ideas for new music, Charles never told Eddie that he was sick. He died of cancer in 2001. Eddie hadn't stopped making music. He wrote songs for other people, including the English pop group Eternal. He worked closely with the Danish producer Paul Brun, which led to Eddie getting credits on a handful of massive Scandinavian records. But as he told Aquarium Drunkard in 2020, he was lost in those years. One day he walked into his studio, the same as he had every day, and realized he didn't want to make any music. He was depressed. A perceptive friend sent Eddie a camera with a note saying, I think you'd be good at this. And somewhat inevitably, he was. In fact, he ended up as the creative director at Ultra Magazine. He still had music in him though. He'd written and recorded some songs with his wife, Sissy, though that wasn't really meant for a wide audience. It was only in 2018 when a mutual friend set up a meeting in LA between Chacon and the jazz soul songwriter and producer John Carroll Kirby that he really entertained the notion of returning to music. The result was Pleasure, Joy and Happiness, produced by Kirby, a moody, gently funky, oddly meditative record that sounded unlike anything Chacon had done before. Chacon, between a falsetto and a honeyed croon, always seemed to be ruminating on something or dispensing some gentle wisdom. And though at times it seemed like it might have been his swan song, a perfectly unexpected record to call time on a completely unconventional career, Chacon is back again. His new album, Sundown, is out this Friday. Recorded in part on Ibiza, 
after a fan and perfect stranger offered up his house on the island. It picks up where pleasure, joy and happiness faded out. It's an album that wants to be linear, free from crescendos or emotional peaks. It aspires, like much of what Chacon does, to nothingness. Still, it's weirdly unforgettable. Chacon and Kirby create an atmosphere on sundown, something warm, welcoming, unhurried, that you'll feel compelled to revisit. A few weeks ago, I called Chacon at his home in LA to discuss the influence of Laraji on his music, the extremely weird path that's led him to sundown, and the quest to rid ourselves of bullshit. I wanted to begin talking about a show that you played recently at Public Records. You played with uh, Laraji. I read that he was sort of a foundational influence. What made you gravitate towards Laraji's music? What, what did you admire about it? I didn't want to fight my age. I wanted to make something that you'd have to be my age and have the life experience that I've had to make. But sometimes when you embark on something, it's almost as though you need to give yourself permission. I was looking for someone who had done it so beautifully so that I could sort of like see, have some sort of a roadmap. And I wanted to do something that was tender and kind. I also had this idea that counter to the pop music industry, I wanted to do something that was quite linear. I didn't want anything to stick out. I wanted it to be kind of a meditative experience. And I had conveyed these things to John Carroll Kirby. He said, that's interesting. I think you would like this guy, LaRaji, and turn me on to um, Vision Songs. And I listened to it, and it just embodied so many of the things that I had in mind that would help create a, a framework for me to express what I wanted to express vocally and lyrically. And that's how all that came about. I immersed myself in the record and I can honestly say that it, it really was a great catalyst for helping me to get to where I was trying to get within myself. Was that the first time you'd had the chance to meet him? Yeah, it was the first time I met him in person. We'd had a few interactions back and forth when he did the remix of Outside for the Pleasure, Joy and Happiness record. But it was uh, pure joy, as you can imagine, seeing him in the flesh there and having him up on stage with us. I didn't really know what to expect. And I think that because Laraji has somewhat of an image of being kind of a guru in a way, that I think maybe some people are quite intimidated by him and think that he might, I don't know, that you may have to connect with him on a otherworldly kind of dimension. But he's actually just the most down-to-earth, very kind and gentle guy with a great sense of humor. He's really sweet, which is even more what cohesive with his beautiful music in my mind. Before we dive into Sundown, I wanted to start much, much earlier, partly because we haven't spoken for the Fader before, but also I wonder if there are some things that we could dive into from the past that could inform the present. I want to go way, way back to like Fry by Night, which of course you were, you were in with Cliff Burton and, and Mike Bodden. And do you remember, I mean, I know what the answer is for most 12 year old kids, but do you know what, what made you want to play in a band for the first time? Yeah, my parents... My mother in particular just really admired and looked up to rock stars. She was kind of obsessed with Rod Stewart and Elvis Presley. They grew up in the in the 50s. You know, in seeking your parents' approval, you try to connect with them through their interests. And my mom's interest was Elvis Presley and Rod Stewart. <laughs> so, uh, and my father, as I came to learn later in life, actually wanted to be a singer. He was a, sort of a jazz aficionado. He was very into Dave Brubeck, and Johnny Hartman was his favorite singer. And I only found out recently that when he was about 15 years old, he went with a fake ID on the bus from Oakland to San Francisco and was dressed with white shoes and a white suit and had his hair slicked back, real 1950s. And he took the bus to 
a venue, I think called the Blackhawk or something in San Francisco. And he saw Brubeck and Coltrane. I only found that out recently. And I actually looked it up online and found the poster for the gig. And he was like, yep, that's it. I think that must have had to do with why I put music on such a pedestal. Because your older brother was really into Zeppelin as well, right? Like there was rock music was around. Yeah, our house was just filled with music. I'm the youngest of three. My older brother was obsessed obsessed with Led Zeppelin and Robin Trower and CSNY. And he actually had terrific taste in music. And he was just banging that, oh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon and Pink Floyd Animals. These were like the soundtracks of my childhood. That was through one bedroom wall because I had the middle bedroom. And on the other bedroom wall, my brother Jim was obsessed with early Barbra Streisand and the soundtrack from Lady Sings the Blues where Diana Ross is playing the part of Billie Holiday. So I just had this mixture of hard rock. My mom and dad called it acid rock and crooning soul music. A lot of Billie Holiday was played in our house actually growing up. And then I became obsessed with James Brown when he came out with Good on Get on the Good Foot Part 1 and 2. And I remember having that 45 and playing it on our green shag carpet and this little record player we had. And man, we just, three little kids just danced around that 45 until we wore it into the ground, man. I think we actually bought the same 45. We would go to Walgreens and buy the same 45 over and over again because we it would just get so scratched up from skipping all around from us jumping around it. <laughs> that, it's amazing. I mean, you, with all of that, you obviously develop this love and admiration for musicians. And as you say, your, your parents put them on a pedestal. But what was the impulse to, to write, to create your own music? Because you could have covered, were you writing your own music in even as early as Friday by Night? You know, it's funny because I started writing my own music. My brother tells me that I would like make up these songs and tell them that they were mine from the time I was like five, six years old. And he would say, you didn't write that. And I would say, yes, I did. I was trying to make up songs that sounded like the Delphonics or Bloodstone, um, like Bloodstone, Natural High. These are like pivotal songs to me. There was a band called Cold Blood featuring Lydia Pence. They were from the San Francisco Bay Area, I believe. So they were really popular in our house. And she was like a sort of a Janis Joplin-esque soul singer, a beautiful blonde girl singing like Janis Joplin or something. And it freaked me out. I can kind of almost decipher the vocabulary of myself as a singer, like where certain aspects of my tone came from, because Sometimes my voice has like a somewhat of a raspy grit, and I always used to try to mimic Lydia Pence. I wanted to have this kind of like crooning, easy, low tonality, and I became obsessed with the song Natural High by Bloodstone. And then, of course, Tower of Power was a pivotal band if you grew up in Northern California in the late 60s and early 70s, and of course, Sly Stone. So I can almost like put together this little jigsaw puzzle of where different parts of my voice were formed. When you then moved to New York City, I mean, I can hear how all of those influence would have been swirling around you when you moved to to New York and, and sign your deal. And then you meet Charles. It's so interesting reading about your relationship with Charles. Like when you first meet, obviously you didn't really you didn't know who each other were the first minute and then you realized that you were signed to the same deal through the same person right we were both in development at Capitol records with josh deutsch the the way that you you've spoken about it in the past it seems like you and charles almost had a sort of compulsive desire to keep writing music that you were writing wherever and whenever you could that was largely driven by josh deutsch i never met anybody like josh and i really have to credit him for taking what was already a strong work ethic and just really upping the ante. I mean, this guy had me whipping out my guitar in taxi cabs going from uptown to downtown to a studio. And I'm like, dude, we're going to be in the car all of five minutes. He's like, just, just get it out, man. Just get out the guitar. Let's, let's, let's do something. I mean, he just had this like drive that I don't think I'd ever met anybody 
like that before him. I think that played a role in that. Yeah, we were. We were we were lying on the ground, like writing lyrics on napkins, and we were in 30-day rental. So we were moving to a different apartment in Manhattan every 30 days. We lived in the West Village. We lived in the East Village. We lived Upper West Side. We lived Upper 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 East Side. I mean, we were just all over every 30 days, but it was a very intense period of songwriting and creativity. And then it it just sort of dissolves. Uh, You know, you have great success, obviously, and the good news after good news after good news, and you're featured in some fantastic films, and you have obviously a very one high, very high charting single. When you realized that you were going to leave the label, did you think that you would pick up and take it somewhere else? Or was your relationship there so central to it that you suspected things might start to start to stop, basically? I think we thought that what turned out to be a permanent break was just going to be a short break initially. In fact, we didn't get dropped from Capitol Records after the second record, which d- didn't perform as well as the first record. Our champion, Hale Milgram, who was the president of Capitol Records and loved us dearly. We were an act that was close to his heart, and the type of music we were doing was close to his heart. He suddenly retired and was replaced by the guy that had signed Nirvana. And so we just felt like an incredible disconnect with the new guy. It was nothing personal. It was just that he was moving in the business of rock music and we were not really in the business of rock music. I remember having a meeting with him and saying, you know, we've been great business partners. It's been an amazing experience for us, but I think we should, we're moving in different directions. We should go our own way. And he let us off the label. And then I can't remember now, it's been too long, but there was a a series of awful events in which in and around that time period, Charles lost his father and his sister. And that was just incredibly sad. And he was just overcome with grief at the time. And I was much younger and far more narcissistic. So I was more driven by the music and career. And I don't know that I was really able to process that the way I probably would have processed it, processed it today with regard to what he was probably going through at the time. So months turn into years. And a few years after that, I got a phone call from Chris Franz, that Charles had passed away. I didn't know that he had cancer. In fact, within six months of his death, we had started talking on the phone again and sending cassettes back and forth to each other with song ideas. And I remember one of the last things we said was, let's get an attorney to get us a record deal again and make another record. And then um, next thing I know, he had passed away from cancer. It must have been really shocking. It was shocking in more ways than one. Not only did I lose a best friend, but I also lost lost a safety net because I think that I wasn't immensely driven. I was kind of offer, operating in a sort of comfort bubble that, oh, I could always just call up Charles and say, let's get an attorney to get us a big time record deal, get some money rolling in and let's do this. Let's make a sick record. And that was somewhat of a safety net that made me lazy. But also, I remember when Chris Franz gave me that news, man, I just hung up the phone and wept. And all I could think of was how we started with nothing and neither one of us had nothing materially. We were just broke. And I was on my last $500 and I know he was broke too. And I just looked around and by that time I had bought a beautiful house in the hills, basically my rock star dream home. And I had my walls filled, just covered with 25 gold records that we had received. And I just had this immense sadness come over me. The man who traversed the whole journey with me from nothingness to us both having our dreams come true, homes and, and comfort and all the joy and gratification that goes with that. And it was just gone. I remember being in touch with those emotions and it just made me feel such a depth of sadness. You, you're living in, in LA at the time, obviously. How, how soon after that do you, do you go to Denmark? Denmark was happening simultaneously, probably toward the end of Duophonic period and the beginning of Chocolate Milk. What it was is 
EMI World Headquarters, they have these seminars where they bring in the presidents of all the satellite offices from all over the world, and they have their top five acts that they call them world priorities perform for the company presidents of all the different satellite offices so that they can see what they're going to be focusing on over the next year. Well, I just really hit it off with the Danish EMI president named Paul Brune. I didn't know that he was actually a legend, legendary figure in the rock and roll industry who had discovered and produced uh, all the gasoline records and Kim Larson and had just had this magnificent some people would actually credit him with bringing rock and roll to to denmark i didn't know this about him i just hit it off with him like fast friends just an immediate deep connection he's still one of my best friends in the world today but um he started flying me to denmark and actually flying me to gosh curacao and london and all these different places around the world to help him make records he would executive produce and I would produce or or we would produce together or he would just put me in a studio to write songs and then he would put these songs out with all of the the t- the top danish artists of the time they were singing in english but they were danish danish artists on EMI and he was very powerful those records would come out and just debut at number 1 on the chart i think i had like 5 6 7 number 1 hits with him in those territories I couldn't have been luckier, really, because we really turned out to be kind of one-hit wonders. And we were not able to follow up such a massive hit like Would I Lie to You. It was just impossible. And we also didn't have the the know-how to create a follow-up record. We fell into many of the traps that you do when you, when you make a, you know, what creates a sophomore slump and you make a follow-up to a big hit. But he kept me busy. And I had so many records in the record store and I was having hits and I was on the charts and I didn't really know much about the publishing and songwriting business. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. When you're a singer, you have one record in the store. When you're a producer writer, you have five records in the store. And I, I really felt like maybe I'm meant to do this. So it gave me a tremendous sense of purpose, which I suppose probably kept some of the, uh, the negative aspects of having fame slip away from you so quickly from such a high point. Uh, I think it kept those, those negative, the negative aspects of that at bay. You have this moment then in, I suppose it's around 2005, maybe 2006, where you just stop. Your wife says he came into the studio and you, you just said, no, I'm that that's it. And you don't really return. Why? What, what happened? That was one of the saddest moments of my life. I had a studio my whole life from the time I was a kid. And it was just first order of business for me to wake up in the morning, wander into the studio, turn it on, sit down in my chair and go. I guess after having just done this my whole life, I just realized that nobody was listening anymore. Nobody was waiting for the next Eddie Chacon song or creation. And I just fell into despair actually, and turned it off for what I thought would be a two-day break, a three-day break, turned into a two-week, a two-month, a two years, 10 years, 20 years of just not doing music. Do you remember when it was? I'm a mad scientist artist, like many artists are, but I also have something in my sauce where I'm quite ambitious, and I do constantly gauge where I'm at in the real world. Like, am I making hits? I've always been quite a good administrator, I'd have to admit. I would always, on one side of the pie, be a mad scientist. On the other side of the pie, I could easily be that guy who's making a million phone calls, trying to connect with people, trying to get meetings. I had great confidence in what I was doing and always felt that if you just get me into the room with someone, I can do the rest. I used to tell that to Victoria Clare, the first person who signed me to CBS Song. She was the senior VP. I would say, you get me in the room with them and I will do the rest. If there was a language I knew how to speak more than anything, it was the language of music. There's no other area in my life where I feel this confident.
Well, then that manifests in this first meeting with with John, to this sort of exploratory meeting, which in this incredibly Los Angeles way is, of course, conducted in a car. You must have been ready. I know that you'd made some music with Sissy in the meantime as well, and you'd been you'd been exploring making music again. What was it about that meeting with John that convinced you to do this again in earnest? Well, the thing that made me want to take the meeting with him was that I so loved the records that he had been making in the couple years previous. Uh, he was working with Solange and um, Frank Ocean and Blood Orange. And he j- just had done things that to me were very, they were very flipped, fresh perspective on indie music. And of course, it appealed to me that he was working with synths from my era, but he just seemed to be so astute at manipulating them to his liking in a new, fresh way. I've always been quite spoiled and thought the last thing I would ever want to be on this planet would be a heritage artist or someone who falls into the trope of being like, Eddie Chacon sings Motown. (laughs) So I always thought to myself, if my journey is not looking to the future, and if I'm not discovering... digging up new ground and discovering new things in myself as I have always done my whole life, I don't want to do music. I would rather just leave well enough alone. When I met John, I never thought I would have the opportunity. Well, I never thought someone who was at a high point in his career would have any interest in working with a 50-something-year-old man who hadn't made a record in 20, 30 years and, and whose last success was from the early 90s. Um, So that was curious enough to me in and of itself that he wanted to meet with me. I think what what I find so interesting about your relationship with John, because I can see the parallels between, certainly sonically, between what you guys do and so much of what we've just spoken about is about collaboration and is about working with others and finding that communion. And, you know, whether it's with Charles or with Sissy, even going back to, you know, playing in your first bands, you've and, and producing for people in, in in Denmark what is it that you find in this communion with other people in in collaboration that helps you to, to find your peak well I've always felt like the job of a good collaborator or producer is to mine the gold in the people you work with um, in fact to give some context to the work that I did with sissy I didn't put my name on it because I didn't really see that as me doing music as much as it was my desire to pull music out of her, to help her become fully realized in something that she wasn't acknowledging about herself. I wanted to help mentor a part of her. I do find that the essence of great collaborations is a genuine interest in helping out the other, not helping out yourself. It can't be a self-serving endeavor for it to be great. It has to be in the service of someone else to be great, I believe. When you do make this album, that, that, that first record with John, the way you've talked about it recently seems to be that you you maybe considered it that it might be a swan song. You know, you didn't want to just be Eddie Chacon sings Motown. So here's my statement, here's something I can do. Why did you want a swan song? My curiosity in making a record after having not made records for so many years, to me, there was always this unanswered question. What happens to talent as it just sits and is underutilized and not given a purpose? Does it mature like wine or does it fade with time? And this question was at the forefront of my mind all the time. Making a record at age 56 after having not done music seriously for over 20 years was part of me trying to answer that question. I had my own opinion that there's things I want to say and I feel and see in a way that I could not possibly have felt or seen 20, 30 years ago. And Wouldn't that be wonderful to incorporate that into a new project and see what happens? I didn't know that there would be an audience for it. I didn't expect that anyone would want to hear it because it's it's very quiet. 
and I wanted it to be linear and kind of meditative. And I wanted it to be a listening experience. It's kind of funny. I remember telling John I didn't want anything to stick out, which is kind of counterintuitive to trying to make popular music. When did you realize that you wanted to keep doing this? You didn't want that to be your swan song, that this was the beginning of something and not the end of something. I didn't have a realization. I have zero entitlement and don't think that the universe owes me anything. I just take it moment to moment and... Some of the following moments involved uh, Chris from Stone's Throw, who's known as Peanut Butter Wolf. We started to talk regularly as friends. We're roughly the same age. We're both from Northern California, and we both worked with some of the early pioneers of hip-hop and all that, and we have a lot in common. In those conversations, I started to make new music with John, and he was really, really interested in it, and And um, we just moved forward really on our own, out of our own desire to keep the relationship going. I never really thought of it as a follow-up record. And even if it was a follow-up record, what I have learned from my past experience with Charles is don't overthink it. If there's magic in the room, let it be. So we didn't continue like, oh, with the heaviness or significance of we're making a follow-up record. We've got to make it better or bigger or splashier. We just showed up. On that note, you go and record this album in what sounds like paradise. You do a lot of the writing and recording in in Ibiza, but away from the raves. First of all, why Ibiza of all places? Actually, um... A perfect stranger said, my family and I have a beautiful house in Ibiza, and we want to thank you for helping us get through COVID with your beautiful record, and I'd like to gift you this house. We won't be there. You and John or whoever you want to bring, uh, show up and be creative. The only thing I ask is that you do something creative in the home. And... uh, I called him up and spoke to him, and he just turned out to be the most lovely guy, and we're now friends. And we took him up on the offer, and we we went to his beautiful house in Ibiza, and once again, John set up a recording studio, and and we did our thing. What do you think the location brought to the album? Well, I think the reason why a lot of artists get out of the town that they live in is just to get away from the distraction. So the first thing you get from doing this is just ability to focus and hone in on you're just there to create. So you're not bogged down with paying the bills or dealing with um, plumbing issues or having to vacuum and dust your house. (laughs) You spoke before in an interview about pleasure, joy and happiness, having a, a nothingness to it, which maybe is related to this sort of linear nature of these albums that you're talking about. But there's something, the nothingness seems even a step beyond that. Like there's there's something quite meditative about that. By the sounds of it, this experience in Ibiza, and again, getting rid of these distractions and everything, do you feel that Sundown maybe has a, a, that same nothingness to it? Well, nothingness is, it's probably like the basic core of what I aspire towards just as a person at this point in my life over the last few years. And I can't take credit for it. I think I read it somewhere. And then I think I, at some point, someone broke down the word into no thingness. And I think I just fell in love with that. And that really resonated me with me because I do have an aversion to things being a thing, a gimmick, a trick, I love this idea that you're never, ever, ever getting over on anyone, ever. We know. And so I love this idea of no thingness, nothingness. So yeah, it's not something I had to think about in making Sundown. It's just the core of where I'm coming from. We can make it holy.
so much of what you've done on the last two records, it had a very strong visual identity. And I hope some humor. Very much so, yeah. Especially like the video for Holy Hell, I think was definitely, like, there's, a, there's a strong sense of humor to it. You've done so much in your career, we sort of skipped over it, but you spend a lot of your career, that you, you are an accomplished photographer, you worked as a creative director. How have you applied that to, and not just in the aesthetic principles of the last two records, but the, the things that can carry over from visuals to music, how, how has that worked its way into, into your music? I think it's a perfect illustration of the saying, there is no fail. Because so many of the things that I failed at all turn out to give me this sort of spice rack to make sauces, to make interesting sauces with. And they, your failures are your, they become your vocabulary of what not to do and what to, I mean, we're probably formed more by what not to do than what to do. I had no idea why I became a, um, a fashion creative director for a magazine, but it was something I was really interested in doing. I was really interested in orchestrating shoots and working with great photographers and stylists and graphic artists and and content makers all around the world. As we talked about, I'm extremely driven towards collaboration. And these collaborations involve sometimes seven, eight, ten people. And that was just a thrill for me. I had no idea that later on music would come back into my life. And for the first time ever, I would have the skill set to make a cohesive packaging that didn't distract people from hearing the music. And so here I was many years later working as a creative director, fashion director, photographer. And little did I know that that would serve me in the way that it served me. It, it all came together as though it was meant to be. <laughs> but um, I fell into photography, actually, after I had that immense crash and I was in despair over not doing music any longer. One of my deepest, uh, longest friendships uh, is a guy named, with a guy named Eddie Delva, who I've known for 30, 40 years from the industry. He knows me well like a brother. And he sent me a very fancy camera with a sticky note on it that said, I think you'd be good at this. And I just opened up that gift and read the owner's manual and got online and started obsessing myself with watching YouTube videos of how to operate a camera and how to make great pictures and reading everything I could get my hands on quite obsessively. And I started shooting pictures right away. And right away, I started getting my pictures in respectable enough publications that all my friends were like, wow, I can't believe you're getting to shoot for this magazine. I was like, I'm kind of staggering here, but I didn't really get nervous or about shooting for these magazines because I had no clue of their stature, which that's always wonderful when you don't know enough about what you're doing to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing led to another and I wound up doing a lot of fashion photography and this went on for about 10 years. And then um, my wife, Sissy would style the shoots and put together the looks and the clothing. And, and then we started to get hired as a team. People started to hire me to shoot my wife, Sissy, and it just turned into a whole unexpected career. Uh, it gave me a sense of purpose in a time when I, in, in a time that, I was quite sad about losing my my first love, music. What's your lyric writing process like? How do you come to a song like, say, the title track, like Sundown? Well, my lyric writing process has quite a wide spectrum because it goes from absolute obsessive lyric writing and just a sort of drudgery of writing like so much shit that I just throw away, delete, delete, delete. And one thing I do have the ability to do is I know when it's right. I know when I've hit it, but it takes me a long time to get to it. Sometimes it's for me on one end of the spectrum, it's all blood, sweat and tears. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I'm highly conceptual. So on each record, there's two or three songs that I've decided you don't get to write a lyric here. You're going to pick up the mic and you don't get to rehearse this and you're going to stream of consciousness. In that, I psych myself into 
this viewpoint that you've had your whole life to write this song. Just get out of your own way and let it go. And those songs are equally as valid. They're two different approaches. One is valid as the other, and I enjoy them both. I feel like the point of this journey should be to slowly but surely rid ourselves of our bullshit. (laughs) When you do something stream of consciousness, when you freestyle, you're sort of taking your own temperature to see what's in there. That seems like a it's a perfect place for us to <laughs> for us to end, Eddie. I love that. <laughs> All right, man. That's great. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. That was Eddie Chacon in conversation with the Fader. Eddie Chacon's new album, Sundown, is out this Friday, March 31st, via Stone's Throw Records. The Fader interview is engineered by Tony Giambroni. The executive producer is Alex Robert Ross, and the associate producer is Raphael Helfand. We'd like to thank Lauten Audio for providing our microphones. You can find them online at lautenaudio.com. And we'd like to thank James Ivey for providing our intro music. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate if you left a five-star rating and review. And do keep an eye on thefader.com for essential music news, interviews, and essays. We'll be back soon with another episode of The Fader Interview. Goodbye until then. You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today.